How's it going everyone? Welcome back to the homestead. In this episode of the Modern Mountain Man Project, we're going to be talking about one of the most iconic pieces of vintage logging equipment, the two-man crosscut saw. Now just like always, timestamps are below because this is going to be a pretty lengthy video, but nevertheless, let's get into it. The spring is coming, I can smell it all around. I'm so tempted by that high water sound. Similar to axes, Saws have been around in some form or fashion for hundreds, if not thousands of years. But in the late 1800s, we saw a massive logging boom that led to multiple innovations for faster and easier cutting saws. The main one of those being the crescent grind. Most saws, especially modern day saws, are just a flat grind, meaning they're a flat sheet of steel with the teeth offset in order to make that kerf, to make the cut. With a crescent grind, not only is the spine of the saw thinner than where the teeth are, but then the center of the saw is also thinner than where the handles go. That allows you to not have to set those teeth as much so it doesn't take as much force to cut, but then it also prevents the saw from binding as it works its way through that kerf, both of which are incredibly important when you're cutting any wood. And the manufacturing process for these saws was absolutely incredible, requiring massive machines to put on that crescent grind and massive amounts of manpower to hand file all those teeth. But unfortunately, that manufacturing process has been lost to time, being as in the late 50s to early 60s, we saw the chainsaw introduced. However, in 1964, we also saw the Wilderness Act passed, which barred the use of any mechanized equipment, including chainsaws, in designated Big W Wilderness, of which we have the vast majority out here to the West. And not only are these saws still practical for work like trail building or wildland firefighting within designated wilderness areas, but they're also still practical for people like me who live in wildfire prone regions of the country. Because typically every summer we're faced with stage two fire restrictions, which prevents me from running my chainsaw anytime after 1 p.m. So if I need to or want to cut wood after one, one of these crosscut saws is my next best option. And then if we're considering a long-term backcountry trip, whether that be multiple weeks or potentially multiple months, one of these saws is a much better option than a folding saw, both in terms of the lack of potential breakage, as well as the ability to process much more wood much more efficiently. Now let's talk about the different types of these saws. And there's two categories that they fall into, bucking saws and felling saws. And you can probably guess which they're each used for, but bucking saws are gonna have a flat back and are usually gonna have a stiffer taper and two handle holes. The stiffer taper is hopefully gonna keep that saw from bending in the cut, and the second handle hole is gonna allow you to move that handle up a position so that you can get a little bit more leverage on that cut. Felling saws, on the other hand, are gonna have a curved back so that you can put wedges in to push that tree over, are usually gonna have a thinner taper and are gonna have one handle hole because you don't need that extra leverage when you're just cutting in your face cut or the back cut. Now the exception to that rule are Canadian saws, which whether they're felling or bucking, generally came with three handle holes. And a perfect example is this Canadian made Simons 325 felling saw, which you can see has three handle holes per end. Just kind of something a little unique there to mention. And these saws came with many different teeth patterns. But the most prevalent here in the West would either be the lance tooth or the perforated lance. Reason being is they're the best suited for cutting softwoods like pine, spruce, and fir, as opposed to the hardwoods of the East Coast. And they also came in a very wide range of lengths, from four feet all the way up to 21 feet from what I understand. Now, of course, bigger isn't always better in this instance, because if you're cutting a smaller piece of wood, you don't necessarily need a massive saw. And then to packing it also becomes an issue. But that can go both ways because a shorter saw isn't able to bend around a pack, whereas a longer saw like a six or seven foot can easily be bent around a fire pack or a pack mule to be brought into the backcountry. Now, before we talk about these specific saws or my saw preferences, 
I think it's important that we talk a little bit about the handles because that's how we're going to interface with these saws. So the handles are just as important as the saws themselves. And broadly speaking, there's two types of handles. You have the loop style and you have the pin style. The loop style has a loop of metal that wraps over the end of the saw before it gets tightened down. The pin style has a piece of metal with a groove cut in it that slips over the end of the saw and then a pin that fits through the pinhole. Pretty self-explanatory. Now I tend to stay away from the loop style handles. The biggest reason being they're not that versatile. You can't underbuck with them. If you're in a situation where you need to turn that handle sideways, you typically can't do that. Now there are some type of loop handles that allow you to do that, but like this type, you're not gonna be able to. You also can't move that handle up or down, like in the case of this bucking saw, nor are you able to even use the handle on a saw that has the teeth running all the way to the end. Because unlike this saw, where you have a spot for that loop handle to sit, on this saw back here or this saw up here, that loop would be sitting directly on those end teeth. So not good for the saw. Those were specifically designed for the pin style handle. Now my favorite handles, and by far the most sought after, would be what are known as Western handles. They have a finger guard down here, and they also have the ability to be moved in different positions. So that allows you, like I say, to either underbuck, or if you do need to cut with the handle sideways for some reason, like if you're close to the ground, you can make that happen. Now let's talk about these saws. Up front, we got this four and a half foot Simons. Now I'm not totally sure on the model number, but it has what I'm gonna describe as the diamond etching. And the first two digits of that model number, the only two that I can make out, is 51 something. 518, 519, something like that. It has that sort of shape to it. It's definitely not a 513 Royal Chinook, but 51 something. And in the catalogs, I did find a 519 that resembles this saw, but the 519 is a lance tooth, whereas this is a perforated lance. And the dimensions of a 519 four and a half foot are not the same as this saw here. But nevertheless, it is 100% a Simon saw, so it's a good saw. Next up, we got a five foot Olin Bishop bucking saw, model 225A. And this is a great all around saw. Yes, it's a bucking saw, but it can be used for felling very easily. Because let's face it, if you're gonna be using one of these saws, you're probably not gonna be felling a tree against its lean where you're gonna to need to hammer wedges in. You're probably gonna be felling it with the lean. So having the extra length on that back of the spine instead of having the taper of a felling saw, not really gonna make that big of a deal. And I'm honestly not totally sure if this saw was filed after the factory because the rakers sure don't look touched at all. And I can tell you that it definitely needs a tune up like it hasn't seen filing post factory. So just kind of a neat note there, but nevertheless, a very nice, well serviceable saw. Now let's talk about this collector's piece. As I already mentioned, it's a made in Canada Simons model 325 felling saw. It's a five and a half foot. And yes, it is brand new. It says never touched a piece of wood besides the guard that came with it from the factory. It even has the original factory filing instructions. Pretty dang neat. Yes, these guys are still out there. They're not too easy to come by, but you can find them and you can get a pretty good deal because I got a smoking deal on this guy. Last but certainly not least is my favorite working saw. This is a six foot Simons 513 Royal Chinook. The creme de la creme in my opinion. Beautiful lance teeth, cuts incredibly well in the wood. It's the saw that you saw me using at the beginning of this video. And I have not touched the teeth since I got it at a local antique store. This saw cuts incredibly well straight from the antique store. I love this thing. Now, like with all my saws, yes, it can use a tune up, but the fact that I'm able to take it straight from an antique store and put it into wood and have it cut some pretty good noodles, I can't be happier with that. This is a great piece of equipment that I am very proud to own. That's about all I got for you in this video, you guys, but this is definitely not the last video to feature these saws. So if this is something that interests you, please subscribe if you haven't done so already. Like the video if you did like the video and share it with someone that you think also might enjoy it. If you have any comments or questions, please leave them down below in the comments. And with that, 
Thanks for watching. Think for yourself. Shoot straight, and I'll see you next time.